probably start now. We're close. Oh, okay. All right, all right. Sounds good. Yeah. We, we don't keep quite as accurate time as WWV does. So. <laughs> WWV, the, the heartbeat of the electromagnetic spectrum. We love it, yeah. So you have met my colleagues. You have met WADDU. You have met the ionosphere. Let's get to work. We have a different way of slicing the cake, is, is really what it amounts to. We will be experiencing the same eclipse that all the rest of you will and that the grape network will, but we're examining it differently. Slide? Who is? Uh, someone can, would you like to um, do your own slides here? Uh, it's, yes, exactly. Sebastian and Rachel have really set up this talk well. So you've met all of those things. Uh, Christina will hold forth at lunch and at dinner tonight about why this slide is here. Slide, <laughs> slide please. Yes, good. So you've already met the eclipse. You know where it's going. You know where the WWV is. You know where the skip points are. I'll point out that the real money is on stations on this little splat of the Atlantic coast where the one hop path from WWV will be interrupted by the eclipse. And around Atlanta where the two hop <laughs> path will be. We would like to have more stations along here, but the fleet is in dry dock this year. It's, you know, sometimes that happens. Slide. That was a Mercator projection of the map. Take a look at something more like a Lambert projection centered on the path's center over continental United States. We noticed this last summer and realized that we had a great experiment to do and it was going to be a scramble to get it all set. The eclipse's path, by coincidence of all the things that become coincidence in these settings, approximates the great circle path, so the radio path, from about Austin, and I'm pointing out here arbitrarily, so Austin somewhere in here, to about Cleveland. And we thought, well, wow, maybe we should be beaconing something. We have GPS diode equipment at WADDU. We can recruit the University of Texas at Austin to monitor Doppler shift or something. Wow, okay, let's start. We looked more closely at the map and saw that, interestingly, the eclipse veers off to the east at about Toronto, but if you extend that great circle path, you get to Ottawa. Wow, Ottawa, Ottawa, CHU, why not? So we were having trouble doing this. We were trying to figure out how to reproduce the heartbeat of the electromagnetic spectrum and then realized maybe we don't have to. Slide. Uh, we, we worked on a Rolodex. Yeah, the, the, the ham radio station's little black book of other ham radio stations. Yeah, the Rolodex. Remember what a Rolodex? Yeah. Um, so, oh, Canada. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Canada. They have a better national anthem than we do. So, this is not on the line of the eclipse, and it's not along the Great Circle Path that's really close. So, here, all the way along the Great Circle Path, we get to monitor eclipse effects. And the great question was, where do we put receivers along that line, and who's going to run them? My colleagues will discuss that. Great. So, um, Rachel um, and uh, ooh, names. Um, past two, the past two um, presentations were very good at explaining um, a lot of the details about the ionosphere, but just to review, um, in case you weren't um, in taking uh, an ionospheric physics class, um, you have at nighttime the E layer and the F layer, and then in the daytime you have the ionization of the ionosphere, and the ionosphere will split into the F1, F2, E layer, and D layer. Um, this makes measuring behavior of the D layer particularly difficult outside of the daytime because it's not there. Um, so we are particularly interested in the D and E layer behavior of the ionosphere, and we're generally concerned with time of flight data, received amplitude data, and the space weather data that we can get access to. And we're hoping to better understand the ionospheric response to the eclipse and perhaps figure out are there correlations um, with observations um, that exist now um, and perhaps can we predict behavior of both the ionosphere and radio response to the ionosphere um, given our methods of approach. Next slide. Um, so how are we getting all this data? Uh, so one of these uh, data sources is the uh, 
National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has some very nice satellites up at the L1 Lagrange point, um, and they make all of their data publicly available. You too can know what solar storm is coming soon. Um, and uh, we're pulling a lot of that information in, as well as two different types of data collection units, as we've put it. Uh, one we've named uh, affectionately ET. Um, our, these are our units that we've built, and Mars will get into that in a little bit. Um, and those are distributed along three or six pa along path locations. Um, so from Austin all the way up to um, Ottawa. And each of those stations will be receiving the three different frequencies of CHU. They have GPS disciplined oscillators, which will provide for us a reproduction of the CHU launch time. And then we'll be listening for the reception time. Um, that real time data, that is real time data collection. And um, we've been working very hard to have semi um, real time upload of the received signal. We also have citizen scientists who are happily um, sharing their time and equipment to record audio um, of those received signals. They're not GPS disciplined, but they are nonetheless very, very useful. Um, so those are things recorded using FL Digi. Having, we have web SDR um, stations that are uh, happily lending their time, space, and energy. Um, though they are not GPS disciplined um, and they're not real-time data, they are still very much important. So how are we doing this, Mars? Yeah, this slide's kind of silly. Anyway. <laughs> So we have these mysteriously named ET stations. You can ask more about that later. But this is pretty much all it is. You have a radio, you have a Raspberry Pi with a circuit board and a GPS module. And it records data every second synced to GPS. Slide. Oh. This is the basic data pipeline. You have the radio, GPS module, going into a simple TNC, it's just an ARM Cortex chip, going into the Raspberry Pi via a serial port. It goes into a collection process that runs under system D, so all you have to do is plug in the Pi, it doesn't matter where it is, if it has internet, nothing, it'll just start running. And then it'll go to two places, Google Cloud Storage for reliable data storage, we don't wanna, you know, we're recording on hard drives, but those aren't really reliable, especially if you're shipping them. And then it also goes to a couple of live dashboards we have that we use so we can make sure everything is set up correctly. I can go into more of it later, um, but a lot of this couldn't fit in the scope of this presentation, but how do we use these? We need people to operate them, and Adam can tell you more about that. Thank you, man. Thank you, Maris. So as we mentioned, we have the data collection methods themselves, the ET units. We have that hardware, we have our data science questions, but really, now what? Our next task was to find locations, and this is just for the ET units, to space them relatively evenly along the eclipse path uh, to host the ET stations. But how did we do this? We started first right in Ottawa, Ontario, by the what we call the control station, because CHU is in Ottawa. So Dave Goodwin of the regulatory of the Radio Amateurs of Canada, he's a regulatory affairs officer, has graciously volunteered both his and his kids' houses to host in Ottawa. Then it got a bit more interesting, if you will. We decided here in Cleveland we wanted to host. Um, as well, sets of ET stations for monitoring at our location. However, here on an industrial urban research environment, um, it's a bit noisy. So what we did instead was, a lot of people don't know this, Case Western actually has a farm about 30 minutes off campus. And in this farm, they have an old pig barn turned into an Airbnb. Um, so if you look here, and I, I think Shashank might be in the audience, he went out and he did a random wire antenna for us while being watched by very creepy pig paintings. <laughs> um, we had to reimburse him for mileage. We're also gonna reimburse him for therapy after that. Next we, uh, oh, and then just real quick. Oh yeah, and then uh, we'd also, we, we also sent stations to Terrio, Indiana for Indiana State University's W9ISU. 
to host similar equipment. We wish them a more fun time than we had. However, we wanted to go beyond the Rust Belt. So it gets even weirder, I promise. Um, in St. Louis University, or well, St. Louis in general, we realized we wanted a station there because they're relatively along the eclipse path. And we recruited St. Louis University. The way we recruited them was we hosted a uh, radio chess tournament earlier this year for the Collegiate Amateur Radio Program inspired by 110-year-old newspaper clippings. Um, it turns out they're like the chess capital of the world. So we, we lost against them in chess. But we will not lose is our quality and data now that they're hosting a station for us. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, so Little Rock, this is also a fun story. So we realized we needed Little Rock. We, knew, we didn't know anyone there except um, David's wife, Laura, back there. Thank you, Laura. Her nephew teaches English at the uh, Episcopal Collegiate School and uh, we recruited the physics students. So you can see, this was just about a week ago, they did a very, very nice setup um, in Little Rock out of their field house. And you can see the wire antenna as well. And then Austin, Texas, I think James is watching. Um, we found them, we reached out because we worked them in the school club roundup. And uh, now they're hosting receivers for us. However, we wanted to recruit even more stations to get even more data. Um, and to do this, going back to EQ stations, so not our custom receiver, but we already know, I think everyone here knows, that there is a network of people across the continent more than willing to let us commandeer their equipment for this experiment. And what we did was we created instructions adapted from Christina's instructions for monitoring the 2020 eclipse. Um, using from from WWV, but we adapted it with for the FL Digi recording and instructions on how to set up a Kiwi SDR that we can scrape data from. So what we did, because we, we had the Kiwi SDR instructions, there's a bunch of online maps, as I'm sure we might know, of Kiwi SDRs. So we found ones along or near the eclipse path and reached out to them. Um, a lot of this was over email because I could find their emails. Some of them only had their call sign. So thank you to an unnamed university dean for letting me snail mail them, um, asking permission to use their Kiwi SDRs. Um, and I'd also like to shout out, what, now that we had the instructions, the ARL and Radio Amateurs of Canada did a great job promoting them. So about 50 individuals signed on. At this point, we expect to hopefully get a few terabytes worth of data. Um, from all walks of life, aged 15 to 84, from random wires to professional towers, from central Mexico to Nova Scotia. So if you want to see the map here that Laura did, if you want to say a word or two. Sure. Um, so you can see over here we've got Austin, um, which is our furthest station uh, before we get to Mexico. And you have the station CHU over here. Cleveland is here. We've got our X's on these maps are representing the ET stations, and any of the dots are representing all of those EQ stations that have signed on. This is uh, a preliminary map. We expect that this, the final map of all of the receiving stations will include a few more. Um, I've included in color the uh, different numbers of frequencies that are recorded at each station. Depending on people's setups, we were able to perhaps record all of the th three frequencies that are transmitted by CHU, or um, either by conditions of the location or by conditions of uh, their equipment, it may only be one or two, two uh, frequencies that are recorded per station. Hello again. So we have two, uh, what is it, two weeks still until the eclipse, but we thought we'd give you a quick overlook of what the data might look like. So this here is a live output. This is actually recorded. This is not happening right now, but this is what the, one of the live dashboards we developed looks like. You can see each of these, not all of them are online. Some are being set up by our users, but you can see they update about every second, you know, limited by internet speed. Slide. And that doesn't look like much, but when you put it in here and you do it over the course of a day, you get something pretty cool. So let me walk you through this graph. So up here is the start of the day, and all the way over here is the end of the day. This is one calendar day. 
this is the start of each tick. So it's downsampled. We're not plotting 86,000 seconds, but this gives you a rough idea of what the signal we're hearing from CHU looks like throughout the day. Here's sunset and sunrise, and you can notice you get a little before, but during the night when the D layer is collapsed, or yes, that's right, when the D layer is collapsed, you can see there's nothing here. Nothing at all, and it, the signal goes away, and then you can see it comes back. Now, this is important to note. I told you we were GPS synced. This is the time when the signal is sent out, and you can see we don't hear it until here. So, in a manner, this represents the distance from Cleveland to CHU. Now, another thing to note is this changes. Because the path changes through the D layer and any other layers, that time it takes will change. It's limited to a minimum of this distance, but it may increase as the path increases. So that's what you see there. Um, yeah. So that was a typical day. This is an interesting day because something happened here which allowed signal to get through at approximately, I think, 400, 400 hours UTC. And that's an anomaly. We don't have an exact idea of what we'll see during the eclipse. We have some predictions. But this is what something like that might look like where you get a blip out of nowhere. Um, Yeah, so one of the things I do want to point out is very interesting um, and something that we've seen pretty typically. So there's this nice little curve that happens at sunrise and there is a similar curve that happens at sunset. It's a little obscured because the day, the UTC day ends and so it's cut off a little bit um, in local time. Um, but you see this squiggle of the time of arrival, and you'll also see variations in those squiggles in amplitude um, overall throughout the day, and that is um, particularly on some of the interesting days, you'll see all of a sudden for a short period it gets very, um, gets very strong, whereas around local solar noon, you'd expect it's much quieter. Next slide. So what do we expect? Um, unfortunately, the eclipse hasn't happened yet, so we don't have data about the eclipse. Um, we're hoping for some interesting things, but we are not 100% sure about what those interesting things may look like. We have some theories. Um, it'll be around 1800-ish um, UTC time, but it will be dependent on location. Um, we're expecting the uh, eclipse procession to change the path behavior, um, but we'll be able to, in many ways, separate out some of the path behavior as it's going along the radio path. Um, depending on the location, um, we may expect any of the following to happen. Attenuation of the signal, amplification of the signal, delay or lack of de delay in the time of arrival, from the expected arrival time. So there is, the speed of light is constant. You can't make um, radio waves appear immediately after you've sent them. Um, so there is a time of flight delay that is constant, but that variation is what we're interested in. There could also be no change, which is also interesting. Um, but we don't know what we'll find. Um, and we may serendipitously discover something that we did not expect. So we're really excited to see what this data yields um, because it is, in many ways, one of a kind. So thank you. Any questions? Questions for the group? We have a couple. Uh, sure. Yeah, microphone is best. Thank you. Uh, yeah, real quick, uh, what is your resolution, time resolution? Looks like it's you know better than a millisecond, perhaps, given the signal you're trying to measure and anything else. What, what do you expect to get? Uh, so right now we're sampling at 20,000 hertz, uh, which gives us a bandwidth of 10,000, which is well above the signal we're looking at. Additionally, uh, we're looking at 360 milliseconds. The longest tick CHU outputs is 300 milliseconds, so that gives us some before buffer, time for the signal and after buffer, but that's what it looks like. We just cropped the graph here because if you zoom that far out, it's really hard to see the lines. And we're, At least for these graphs, we're trying to show the time of flight. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but I mean, 
millisecond or better probably for actual problems, you know, time of flight resolution. May, may I offer? Yeah. Um, thank you. No. Yeah, millisecond changes are gross, enormous changes on these graphs. I don't know exactly what our resolution is. I'll guess it's somewhere between a hundredth of a millisecond and a tenth of a millisecond. Okay, thank you. I think we had one more quick one. Uh, <coughs> somebody wants to, oh, back there. Okay, um, Kiwi SDRs, how many, how many do you have um, in your, your list? Yeah, so his question was about Kiwi SCRs. Right now we have, we're up to about 10 or 12 of them okay. um, that let us use it. Um, uh, how, how many are uh, GPS locked? Um, I don't have those exact numbers. I, I, think, I think a few of them are. Um, cause I, 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 that, that makes them really useful. Yeah, they, they are. Yeah, that was, yeah, just, just to clarify with the EQ stations, some of them can be GPS locked. Um, but we're accepting data from, from any of them. Pr pretty much, yeah, pretty much anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, just to clarify, those EQ stations, um, we aren't requiring that they're GPS disciplined, but we are recording if they are, so that we have uh, further information otherwise. And a quick question from Andre, one yeah. of our club officers. So, very quickly, as the radio circuitry and normalization of voltage automatically factor in it, how would you mitigate it? But you don't have to like, go in depth about this, I'll read the paper. But, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the question was about receiver behavior like automatic gain control, which might get in the way of amplitude measurements, for example, I believe, right? That's where you were. Right. Yeah, so unfortunately these like $20 or so receivers we use turned out to have some sort of automatic gain or volume control, some combination thereof. We tried to hack it out, but unfortunately weren't able to do it in time. Uh, the normalized voltage represents us just scaling the 10-bit ADC of the, of the TNC module from 0 to 1023 to negative 1 to 1. Um, but we'll, we're probably going to do some characterization of what the ADC and AVL do to the signal. That'll probably be after we collect the data, when we get the radios back. for his efforts in defeating the AGC. <laughs> I'll also say that a lot, of, um, a lot of our recording and characterizing of this radio behavior and the behavior of our systems, um, a reminder, we came up with this group pretty much by the beginning of this calendar year. So, Getting those, getting the equipment ready and shipped before the eclipse has been a big, big lift from Morris, particularly, who has been working very, very hard on some of this uh, hardware details. But um, all of it is, um, in many ways, um, something that we're hoping to characterize over time as we get the units back, as well as we did a, couple, a little bit of characterization before we sent them out. Yeah. Yeah. Say that.